Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Picture yourself in this situation. Your doorbell rings or you hear a knock at the door and and you go to the door and open it and there before you on your doorstep are two young people, perhaps two young men, very well dressed, maybe with white shirts and ties and perhaps short sleeve white shirts with a little name tag. And they're They want to to tell you about their Mormon faith. Or maybe it's a a, a couple of members of the the Jehovah's Witnesses group who want to talk to you about what they believe. Maybe in either case, or or maybe it's someone from another church of another denomination, maybe you just feel a little bit uncomfortable talking to them. You tell them that you have your own faith and and you don't really want to talk with them right now about what they want to tell you. Uh, You don't want to become caught up in a a religious discussion that might make you uncomfortable, might make you uh, feeling frustrated or confused. And so you politely tell them goodbye and then you close the door and and go back to your business and, and let those unexpected visitors go on their way. But maybe after they leave, maybe you find yourself wishing that that you didn't feel so tongue-tied in that moment. That you wish you could be more confident and, and speak to them and share with them about what you believe. Or perhaps you get a phone call from a friend or a family member or a neighbor who's, who's distressed and upset, maybe because they've just learned that, that they or a loved one have been diagnosed with cancer. Or perhaps you're at, at work in the office and uh, taking a break and one of your coworkers confides in you that their marriage is, is going through a difficult time and, and they're not sure if they'll be able to keep it together. Those are just some of the situations that we certainly will encounter in our lives where we might be called upon to speak God's word to someone who is in great need of it. Situations where God provides us with an open door to be witnesses of the truth of his love and of the way that he pours out his blessings on our lives through Jesus the Savior. But in so many of those situations, so often we we feel uncomfortable, we feel unsure of what to say, we feel tongue-tied in that moment. In our sermon text today, God brings to us a, a message of, of his love, of his encouragement, so that we won't be tongue-tied in those kinds of situations. As we read here in Isaiah chapter 50, we see ultimately that, that these words are a prophecy pointing ahead to the Savior whom God would send. That ultimately Jesus, who is the, the suffering servant of the Lord, as Isaiah prophesies elsewhere, Jesus, the Savior, is the ultimate fulfillment of these words. But also in this section, we see that God wants everyone who believes in him to to confidently, lovingly, and boldly share the good news of his love with others, always trusting in God for his help and his blessing in all those situations. Now, we may not always know all of the answers to all of the questions that people might ask us about what the Bible teaches or or what the, the Christian faith believes, We may not always be in a position to solve every problem that that faces the people that we encounter and that we're talking with. But when that door is open for an opportunity to to bring God's word into a conversation, we can confidently speak a message from God's word, trusting that God will bless it as he promises. First of all, as we see in this reading from Isaiah chapter 50, We know that if we know and believe who the Savior is that God has promised, that Jesus is the Savior by his death on the cross, just knowing that fact, that wonderful truth, the heart and core of the Christian faith, in any situation, we can share that message. And we know that we will not be tongue-tied when we have that message on our hearts and on our lips. As we read the Bible, we see so clearly that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, the one that God promised and appointed to be the suffering servant, 
to be the one who takes the place of all of us, of all the people of the whole world, in paying the punishment for all of our sins. Just as Isaiah, in, in a few chapters in his book of prophecy, in chapter 53, would prophesy so clearly when he said that this coming Savior would be led like a lamb to the slaughter, that he would be despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Jesus, only Jesus, is the one who took our infirmities and carried our sorrows on himself. He is the one who was pierced for our transgressions, who was crushed for our iniquities, for our sins. Jesus is the Savior upon whom the Lord laid the iniquities or sins of us all. Jesus bore all of our sins to death on the cross in our place. And as we read through these verses of Isaiah chapter 50, we see, as we reflect on the life and ministry of Jesus, just how he fulfilled all of these words of prophecy. Only Jesus, throughout his whole life, was not rebellious against the will of God. Only Jesus, throughout his whole life, did not turn back, even in the face of of opposition and persecution, and even in the face of death. Only Jesus perfectly obeyed God's will, even when that meant every day of his public ministry going one step closer to that agonizing death upon the cross. Only Jesus could always say fully with verse 6 of our reading, I submitted my back to those who beat me and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from disgrace and from spit. Jesus went through all of the suffering, all of the mockery, including people spitting upon him in disgust and derision, being beaten, first by the the guards of the high priest and then by the the soldiers of, of the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. And finally, ultimately, he submitted to death on the cross. He submitted to that that greatest punishment and suffering of all, of being totally separated, totally cut off from all the love and blessing of God the Father because he was really bearing the punishment for our sins. And so as we think about what our Savior has done for us, what suffering he went under for the sake of our salvation, for the forgiveness of all of our sins, as we cherish that wonderful truth, which means forgiveness and salvation for us. We will never be tongue-tied when we are encountered with the opportunity to share this good news of God's love and salvation. Instead, we consider it a joy and a privilege, not only to, to know and to believe everything that God has done for us in his love, but also to have that opportunity to confess with our lips Jesus is my Savior. Jesus lived and died for me to save me. And he did it for you, too. Indeed, just as the Apostle Paul tells us in in Philippians chapter 2, we can be confident and bold to speak the truth of these words because God has exalted Jesus to the highest place and has given him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But of course, as we reflect on those words from the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2, and then as we look at the reality of the world around us today, we see that that is not what we observe in the world around us. Not every knee on earth bows to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Not every tongue on earth confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As we look at the world around us, as we we think about the interactions that we have in our lives or the things that we see on, on TV or in movies, we see that perhaps more often than being spoken in praise and thanksgiving, the name of Jesus is instead used as an expletive, as as part of a curse word spoken in anger or or spoken in in careless thought. Today, many people mock the Lord Jesus and all that he stands for. 
And the devil has great success in leading many people to fight against Jesus and his word and his will for our lives. In fact, if we're honest with ourselves, if, as we examine our hearts and lives, we also must confess that we're, we ourselves are not always the faithful followers that Jesus wants us to be. Yes, maybe in, in one moment, perhaps when we're in church on Sunday morning, we might confess, just as Peter did, that Jesus is the Christ. But then perhaps in the next moment or, or not long after, again, just as Peter did, we might deny that Jesus is the Lord. As Peter later did, he denied that he even knew Jesus. Or we might simply just be tongue-tied and, and be silent when we have opportunity to speak about Jesus and our faith in him. Or perhaps by our words or actions, we might actually, in effect, reject Jesus as the Lord of our lives. And so for all, all of these sins and, and failings of ours, for our failure to confess Jesus openly and boldly, and for sometimes perhaps our own abuse of his holy name, for all of our other sins that caused him to suffer and to die for us, we repent and we trust that he is our Savior. We trust that he is our crucified, but yet also risen Lord. Through his death and through his resurrection, we have full forgiveness for all of these sins of ours. We don't want to be tongue-tied in those opportunities to speak about Jesus and speak about our faith. That is where we begin, with the assurance that Jesus has forgiven all of our sins. And then the next step for us who don't want to be tongue-tied Christians, is to be open to the Word of God and to be, to be observant of the people around us and to be aware of the needs that they have, the needs that we can speak to with God's Word. One reason why many Christians are tongue-tied when they have an opportunity to witness about Jesus is that they feel that they just don't know the, the right words to say. Maybe you've felt that way before in your life. But through personal Bible study, ideally daily personal reading of God's Word, by attendance at Bible class and worship here at church, you can gain very helpful wisdom and knowledge from God's Word, the Bible. Just as we read here in these verses, morning by morning, that's a, a wonderful habit and pattern to follow. Uh, perhaps if, if, if you are something of a morning person, at least first thing in the morning, your, your mind, or shortly after you, you get woken up a little bit, your mind is fresh, uh, perhaps free of, of worries and concerns that might come throughout the day. And so that can be a good time to immerse yourself in God's Word and meditate on His Word and pray to Him before you get all wrapped up in the busyness of, of all the rest of the events of the day that will come soon to follow. But if you're just not at all a morning person, if mornings are just way too busy and crazy for you, then find another time throughout the day. Set that time that each day you will spend some time, maybe just a few minutes at first, each day, meditating on God's Word, being renewed and strengthened in your faith through His promises of love and faithfulness. It's in that way that God speaks to you. You can't really expect to be able to speak for God if you haven't first been taught by God. What joy you'll have when you'll be able to say, as the words of our text say, I know how to sustain the weary with a word. Think about that, the, how to sustain the weary. How many people in our world today are so weary? Weary of the same old routine, the, the drudgery, the, the, the burden of, of work. Weary because they, they don't know what the purpose of life is. Weary because they have a Jesus-shaped hole in their heart. They don't yet know his love and forgiveness and salvation. Many people are weary with loneliness, with chronic pain, with grief. 
People are weary searching for help, but not really being able to find what they truly need, what really answers that deep longing in their hearts. So we, we need to be aware of and, and sensitive to the, those needs, the, the weariness of the people around us. We need to be open to their cries of hurt when, they, when they're reaching out and seeking help. And then when, when we observe those, those feelings and those cries for help in the people around us, then we need to be ready to sustain the weary with a word, with God's word. Maybe you've heard in the news recently about some tragic drownings that have happened in Lake Michigan. So think about if, if you happen to be in a situation where you observed a person struggling in the water, you obviously don't have time in that moment, that critical emergency moment, to, to teach the person how to swim and save themselves. No, you need to throw them a life ring, you need to throw them a rope, or, or you need to jump in the water yourself to rescue them from that critical, immediate danger of drowning. That's what God's Word is. It's a lifeline. It's something we can, we can throw out to the person in that critical moment of their need to give them hope, to give them the assurance of their salvation through Jesus. That is what really sustains the weary in every moment of their need in their lives. And so it can, it can even be just a very short passage from the Bible. It doesn't have to be a long explanation of, of all of the truth of, of the history of salvation from Adam and Eve and the creation and the fall into sin and all the way through the Old Testament and then to the birth of Jesus. It can just be a passage of a promise of God's love and faithfulness. Even something like the passage we see uh, mentioned twice in these verses, the Lord God will help me. The Lord God will help me. Repeat that to yourself. Preach it to yourself. Let that first be a comfort and assurance to yourself. And then when you have that short phrase in your mind, in your heart, the Lord God will help me, you can recall that at a moment's notice and share that with someone when you hear about their need, their weariness, their sorrow or grief. Assure them that God has promised, the Lord God will help me. If you trust in the Lord, if you trust in his promises, if you know Jesus as your Savior, then you won't be tongue-tied, even, even if you might face strong opposition or even persecution. There may have been times in your life when you knew that you, you could have said something in a certain situation, you could have spoken up about Jesus, but you remained silent, you remained tongue-tied, perhaps because you were afraid of being mocked, or, of, or perhaps suffering some kind of consequences at your, at your place of employment or at your school if you spoke up about your faith. And so we come back to Peter and, and to what we read about Peter in the Gospel reading. Even though he so correctly stated who Jesus is, Jesus is the Christ, the Savior, yet not too long after that, months or, or perhaps a, a year or two after that, when Jesus had been arrested after he was betrayed by Judas when Jesus was taken to the high priest's palace and he was put on trial and Peter uh, didn't follow him right away. He wasn't willing to be arrested together with Jesus, together with the other disciples. He ran away to prevent his arrest, but later on he secretly followed and went to the courtyard of the high priest and, and he was there outside waiting to hear what would happen to Jesus after his trial. When someone recognized him or heard his accent as a Galilean and they challenged him, you're one of his followers, aren't you? Even though Peter earlier had boldly, correctly confessed, Jesus is the Christ, then at that critical time where perhaps his life could be on the line, Peter, in fear, denied even knowing Jesus and even called down curses upon himself in support of that lie trying to protect himself rather than boldly confessing Jesus as the Savior, no matter what consequences might come of that. Many Christians have that same experience, that, that same kind of fear, fear of persecution and opposition to our faith. 
but also as we look back over the history of the Christian church and over the whole history of God's people all the way back to the beginning of time, we also see that many Christians, many believers in God and his promises have boldly confessed their faith, and some have suffered tragic consequences as a result of their faithfulness to God's word. All because they trusted in God's ultimate protection and his ultimate salvation of their souls and his promise to raise their bodies back to life for perfect eternal life with him in heaven. And so by contrast, for most of us living today here in the United States of America, for most of us, our problem is, is probably more having it too easy in our lives as Christians. Maybe our faith doesn't always mean so much to us because we're not very often called upon or compelled to stand up for our faith, even in the face of opposition. We may feel guilty or we may feel ashamed when we remember the many times that we have failed to speak up, to stand up for Jesus and to speak about our faith, instead remaining silent or tongue-tied or, or afraid of speaking out. And the devil knowing that guilt that we feel because we haven't always seized the opportunities to witness for Jesus that God has given to us. The devil tries to add to our guilt. He tries to, to rub our faces in our guilt and in our failings. He tries to fill us with doubt that, that we could ever hope to be, to be confident enough or confident or competent enough, competent, confident, knowing accurately what to say when we have those opportunities. But by trusting in God, we can be sure that we are prepared. We are sure of his forgiveness of our sins through Jesus. We're sure of God's promise of his power working through us when we speak his word. We're sure that in those situations, we will not be tongue-tied by his grace. The closing verses of our text say, The one who will acquit me is near. Who can accuse me? Let us take our stand. Who can pass judgment on me? Let him approach me. Look, the Lord God will help me. Who then can declare me guilty? The answer, of course, is no one. No one. Because Jesus has taken our guilt and has died on the cross for it. You and I can take these words of Isaiah chapter 50 and can make them our own. Because our Savior not only died, but also rose again and ascended into heaven and is now seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, defending us against the accusations of the devil before God the Father. We can say together with the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8, Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? The answer that's not written after that question in that verse, of course, is no one. No one can bring any charge against us. There is no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus. No power on earth, no spiritual power of evil in the heavenly realms will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we can be bold. We can be confident, and not tongue-tied. Instead, we can look forward to, we can welcome the opportunities that God puts before us to speak up for Jesus and to sustain the weary with a word, with God's word. So let's trust in the name of Jesus, in his power and his blessing. Even when life seems dark, even when the way before us doesn't seem clear or, or seems very difficult, we still hear and obey the voice of our Savior. Through God's word, through the Bible, God strengthens us and builds us up in our faith. He teaches us what to say in those opportunities. Knowing that Jesus is our Savior. Knowing that Jesus is not only our Savior, but he is also the Savior of the whole world. We realize that there is still such a great need for so many more people in our world to come to know and believe in this truth. To hear that message of faith and hope for eternal life. And so may God help each and every one of us to share gladly and boldly 
that message of salvation through Jesus. May we be sensitive to and aware of the needs and the weariness of the people around us so that we are ready with God's word to sustain them in their weariness, to bring them hope, comfort, and joy, just as we have experienced from knowing God's word and his promises. God grant it. Amen.